Well, I began a series entitled The Ecosystem of Faith. The Ecosystem of Faith. And many people get excited and should about faith. They learn some basic foundational principles about faith, but many times their faith goes shipwrecked because they don't understand the ecosystem that makes up this environment we call faith. And one of the things we have to understand that we have individual faith and, and before God need to learn to walk by faith and live by faith. And, but we also have a corporate expression of our faith. And we need to have an environment that is a healthy environment for, for faith. So what is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is the whole group of living and non-living things that make up an environment that affect each other, that affect each other. There's an environment of faith and there's an ecosystem to that environment where there's an interdependency upon those individual parts that make up the whole. And so I don't wanna get bogged down in my introduction but the three major components that make up the environment of faith are hope, love, and patience. And in our next session, I'll share with you a few scriptures how that these things are mentioned together because they work together. Bible faith does not stand alone. It has an environment where it is affected by these different components. The first one we looked at was hope and the importance of Bible hope in your life. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders obtained a good report. So faith is bringing substance to what you hope for. So if you don't understand Bible hope and you don't get your hope up, your, your dreams, your visions, your goals, your imagination, your desires, Jesus said, Mark 11, whatsoever things you desire when you pray or hope when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. So hope is vital. And one of the things we see in this generation is the lack of hope, the lack of hope. You can, you can live 40 days without food, three days without water, you can't make it a day without hope. Hope is a powerful force in your heart and in your life and a component that works with your faith in order to go forward. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Paul says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Man, think about that. Even as a Christian, if all the hope you have is in this life, you're, you're miserable. One of the reasons, oh, praise the Lord. These things come to me on the fly and I just wish they wouldn't. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but when you look out in our world, there's a bunch of miserable people. People that are fill, filled with bitterness and anger and just venom in their speech. And one of the reasons is that the only hope they have, can you imagine for a moment not knowing Jesus? Some of us have known the Lord for so long and walked so intimately with him, it's hard to stop and think, what would life be without Jesus? What would it be without the hope of eternal life? What if all you had to live for is this life and this life alone? You'd be most miserable, I guarantee you. And that's why we see all of this anger and bitterness and miserable people is they don't have any hope in a new heaven and a new earth earth. Any hope in eternity with a, a precious, loving, kind, good God, they don't have any hope. And so they, they are literally self-destructing. And so as a believer, we not only need to understand hope and the power of hope, we need to understand our hope is not in this life only. But yeah, there's a lot of things that I have a hope that I will see before I go home to be with the Lord. I have a natural hope that our children in their schools will be protected from all this cultural rot. I have a hope that we'll get back to a constitutional republic and, and really enjoy our freedoms. I thought the national anthem was gonna break out. Hallelujah, I'm like, thank you, God. 
I have a hope that angels are peering down and listening to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a blessed hope. I have something I didn't have before I met Jesus, and that's a blessed hope, not just of the appearing of Jesus, but that when he appears, I'll be like him. I have a hope that while my body's decaying, there's a Holy Spirit that quickens these mortal bodies, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I have a hope that I will not only prosper and and be in health, but that I can be a blessing. I could go on and on and on. Like I said in our last session, my faith has its tongue hanging out right now bringing substance to the things I hope for, I hope for. So here in this environment, you've got to get your hope up. Maybe you don't have the faith yet to receive a healing, but get your hope up, supernatural hope. Maybe you're struggling in your finances, but get your hope up that your seeds sown are gonna bring in a harvest. Maybe your spouse left. And sorry, I had a thought for some of you that might be a blessing, but for most of us, (laughs) <laughs> I should not have said that. that. For most of us, that would, that would be terrible, terrible. So you, you need to get your hope up that your marriage can be healed and restored and things of that nature. Maybe some of your children have fallen off the cliff. Don't ever lose hope and be like the father waiting and looking for that prodigal son, that was hope. That father had hope that that boy would come back because he was watching for him, he was looking for him. And we see the power of hope in that, that story. So let's talk about the second, the second component because faith works in hope. But Galatians chapter five, verse six says that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith that worketh by love. See, your faith works by love. It works in your hope, but it works by love. And this is something that happened to me in May of 1980 when I had that open vision of the cross. I saw the love of God in the work of the cross. I saw the sacrifice of Jesus and how that was God's love for me. I saw him bearing my sins and that was God's love for me. And so faith was almost a byproduct of seeing God's love for me. And many of you have tasted of the love of God. You've seen it to a measure, but the love of God and the revelation of God's love It's not a one-time thing in your life. It's a a walk that is like peeling an onion. And all of a sudden you, you get this revelation of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would be saved. So you, you taste of the love in a general way, but then you peel the onion and you go, wait a minute, for God so loved Dwayne that he gave his only begotten son. See, some of you, God's love is still a little bit out there. You believe he loves you, but it's not an intimate revelation, personal revelation of his love for you directly between you and him alone. And what is the depth of that and being rooted in that and grounded in that and progressing in that as you peel the onion. Man, I thought I knew God loved me, but boy, today heaven and earth crashed and I got a kiss from heaven. Boom, another layer of that onion, and faith is fed. Faith is strengthened. Faith is ignited. Because, I mean, we could spend hours, and we will. We're, we're, we're going to do the long haul together. But just the basics of faith is trust. I can remember, I can remember my children, all four of them. I traveled a lot back then and we'd stay in hotels with pools and that was the big hook for the kids was the swimming pool. And I would do all my studying out at the swimming pool while they're swimming, but I'd get in the water and you've done it. All of you've done it with your kids. They'll be up on the edge. You'll be in the water. They're not quite ready to get into the deep end, but you just say jump and they come up to the edge and they'll... You know what that's called? Doubt. They're doubting whether you'll catch them. They're doubting whether they'll live or die. They're doubting whether they'll sink or swim. They're doubting whether you'll even be there. You may just 
and let them splash. Some of you, that's how you taught your kids to swim. <laughs> Amen. But once they jump and they're safe and secure and they didn't die, they didn't sink, et cetera, et cetera, the second time they're jumping quicker. And now I have a granddaughter, it's dangerous. She has jumped off of stuff and I wasn't prepared to catch her. Those are good memories and one day will be good stories, but they weren't fun when it happened and you're flat of your back with a kid on top of you. She just trusts me totally. When you see how much God loves you by revelation, with your inner ear versus hearing me right now with this ear. You have two ears on the side of your head and God gives you teachers that stand in front of you to speak to you, but you have an inner ear in your inner man and that ear is backwards to your outer ear and it's like a voice behind you speaking to you. I've heard it many times, I've heard my name Dwayne and I turn around to see who just called my name and there's nobody there. There's a scripture on that, I'm in a hurry. Go, go to Ephesians chapter four and let's talk about God's love in the ecosystem of your faith. Many times, I love you, but listen, I know I told you to turn so it's hard to listen, but listen and turn and pay attention. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I just went whack. We, we, we have to many times Settle in on God's love for us in a problem, God's love for us in a trial, God's love for us in a situation. And many times we, we get to working and focusing in on the faith and, and it's not a faith problem, it's a lack of, of understanding God's love for you. If you knew God's love for you, you wouldn't fear that. If you knew God's love for you, you wouldn't worry about that. Does that make sense at all? And so many times we're working on faith, 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 and all we need to do is realize that faith works by love. And so as you learn to, to yield to the Holy Spirit and Him just show you how much God loves, loves you, your faith just grows and ignites and brings substance even to the things you're hoping for. So let's go through this. I took a little too long there, but Ephesians chapter, chapter three, verse 14, this is Paul praying for the church at Ephesus. And over the years, I've learned to pray for everyone individually, myself individually, these prayers. But we in leadership need to pray over our churches, these prayers. These are eternal prayers. These are anointed prayers. These are spirit-led prayers. So for this reason, verse 14, Ephesians 3, for this reason, bow my knees, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Aren't you glad that there's not just family on the earth that's the family of God, but there's family in heaven? That's why the church is so vital, the church is so part. It's in heaven and in the earth. And at the appearing of Jesus, that's what's gonna happen. The family in heaven and the family of earth are gonna to come together in the manifested now kingdom of God on the earth. He says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love rooted and grounded in love. In this particular setting, I'm confident that if I came up to everybody and asked you, do you know God loves you? Everybody would say yes. But are you rooted in it? Are you grounded in it? Because see, when you get rooted in it and you get grounded in it, no matter what storm comes, no matter what affliction, no matter what crisis, no matter what tribulation, persecution, or on and on I can go, you may bend in the wind, but you're rooted. Amen. That I'm confused, I'm hurting, but nothing shall separate me. I am confident nothing shall separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. When you hear in your head, if God loved you, why are you sick? If God love, loves you, why did your 
Favorite uncle die in that car accident. If God loves you, see the devil will pound your head if you're not rooted and grounded in the love of God to question God's love. Why is he doing that? To get you to doubt, to get you to waver in your faith. For some of you to get you to walk away from your faith. But there's a point where you get so rooted and grounded in God's love for me. I don't have the answer to that, but I have this answer. God is faithful, not guilty. God is with me. I don't care how I feel. God is with me never to leave or forsake me. Why? Love. He loves me. He says he's praying for them to be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width, length, depth, and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. My goodness. I don't don't know how I could go to church my whole life and I never hear these different dimensions. You just say God loves you and people draw a blank anyway. Because we use and abuse the word love to describe so many different things, it is thus descriptive of nothing. When I say God loves you, it's like you don't, you don't even flee. So I, because we say, I love my dog. We say, I, I love my wife. How many of you know there better be a difference in that? And I preached this one time and I had a man with a hat come up to me and say, you bet there's a difference. I love my dog. (laughs) It's like, dude, I think you admit dyslexia is real. I love ice cream. I love going to the movies. I just love this weather that we have. Oh, and by the way, God loves you too. You see how you just draw a blank. And so Paul is praying that you begin to understand there's some depth to God's love for you. There's some height to God's love for you. There's some width you've not experienced to how much God loves you. There's a length that God has gone to that's an eternal length of the outstretched arms of Jesus that demonstrated his love for you and that you know it, but you don't know it like the Holy Spirit wants to reveal it. He wants you to know it past knowledge. How can you know something that passes knowledge? It's by revelation. It's by the Holy Spirit. You know, I love spirit-filled life. I love spirit-filled churches, but man, we can can get hung up on what spirit-filled looks like sometimes. And when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, you got one ditch that just ignores it all and the gifts. Then you got others that get stuck on certain things. But the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5 says that God has shed abroad in your hearts the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit being shed abroad in your heart is to reveal beyond knowledge how much God loves you. Spirit-filled life involves a revelation of this intense covenant, loving kindness unto death, love for you. And it takes the spirit, your brain, your peanut, your dumb head. I can't believe I just said that. I'm trying to eradicate that. I had a lady get mad at me one time. I can't tell the whole story, but she got so mad at me, jumped on the pastor for having me in the church and said, I called her a dumb head. And it, it is a, it's amazing how we haven't trained our ear to hear. For almost an hour, I called her a new creation. I called her the righteousness of God. I called her a child of God, an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus, more than a conqueror. A world overcomer. And I said, you have a dumb head. There's a difference. It'd be rude to call you a dumb head. Y'all didn't get it either, evidently. (laughs) The smartest day you'll ever have in your life is the day you realize you are not real bright after your carnal mind. You have a dumb head. You are precious. Was that pretty straightforward and simple? 
you are blessed with a dumb head. <laughs> we lean to our own understanding and self-destruct. We, we try to conceive and comprehend and process after our carnal, unrenewed mind that the Bible is clear is an enemy of God. Romans 8, 6, and 7. So, Paul is saying, I'm praying that this Holy Spirit that's been shed abroad in your heart, that you learn to listen, that you learn to hear him communicate these dimensions of God's love for you because it will pass knowledge. And as you comprehend it by the Spirit, you'll be filled with the fullness of God. I mean, I love you and I'm looking at most of you, let me go another way here, Lord. I, I looked in the mirror today and I saw some of Jesus, but I didn't see the fullness of Christ. So evidently there's more knowing for me to experience in his love for me that I might be filled with the fullness of God. Think about, think about if a visitor walked in here and we were all being filled and demonstrating the fullness of Christ. God's personal love for us would cause us to be nothing but a blessing to everybody else. Then he says, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think, there's your hope. According to the power that works within us, there's your faith. And it all works by love. So this ecosystem if I'm gonna be a person of faith, if we're gonna be a community of faith, we have to be yielding and growing in our knowing of God's love for us. And as we know his love and get rooted and grounded in his love beyond knowledge, our faith just begins to, to explode in, in all his promises in his plans, in his purposes for our lives. Man, why do so many people, I could, I could spend hours on this, but why do so many people struggle with doing God's will or jumping out? Many of you, this is our indigenous people that are here now. <laughs> You'll have to process that. When the students all show up, <laughs> many of them would have had to really jump to get here. How many didn't jump that God called to get here? Well, you could, you could simplify it and just say, well, it was their faith. Yeah, that's a true statement. If they jumped, they had faith. The others had a measure or some type of faith. Why didn't they jump? They didn't know how much God loved them and you don't have anything to worry about. If he told you to go, go. Amen. See, y'all like it when I talk about other people or Israel or Pharaoh. Yeah. <laughs> Go to 1 John. I need to hurry. I've really got some good things on my heart here that we will be working on in the days to come even. Because I was super blessed to have that open vision and the onion just absolutely peeled with how much God loves me. Paul, you hear him talking in his writings, I am crucified with Christ. See, I saw myself crucified with Christ on the cross in this open vision. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, most Christians never get to the me. And that's when faith in this ecosystem just begins to feed. Your faith feeds on hope and it feeds. It's nurtured on how much God loves you. There's four things in here 
in 1 John that I want to take the remaining of my time. And we could do a series on each one, okay? So we're just going to highlight it. We're going to, we're going to scratch the surface of it. But I'm, I'm praying that it's the Holy Spirit that quickens something you need. Not with your intellect, but with your heart. That as I go through these four observations and I begin to mine out the gold that's in each one of them, some of you are going to sit there and you're going to go, I knew that. I could have preached it better than him. Oh, that's not this group, sorry. (laughs) Others are gonna go, you know, I've kind of seen that, but wait a minute. Something's going to click on the inside that's personal, that's gonna feed and ignite your faith. So let's read it, then we'll come back and we'll look at four profound observation of the apostle of love and his writings mining out God's love for us. Look at this, verse seven, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him in this, the cross, in this is love. In the sacrifice of Jesus, in the father giving Jesus, in this is love. You can turn on the news, you can watch any kind of news outlet and you hear all kinds of perverted, demonic groups talking about love and telling you what love is. And John says, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins. A lot of people that even in the New King James, it says propitiation. They draw a blank. Jesus was the propitiation for your, your sins. That word means satisfaction. A song was written, I can't get no. Okay, let that go. (laughs) Jesus satisfied and appeased God's anger against me, God's wrath against me, any curse of the law against me. He was the propitiation. He was the satisfaction. And what was all of that? Love. Beloved. If God so loved us, we also should love one another. We will never ever (laughs) come close to the love we're supposed to have for each other until we see the love God has for us. You can't love another human being with God's kind of love until you've received it because you don't have any of it in and of yourself. This was a revelation for me. It's outside of the four observations I'm gonna look at. But it is impossible to love with God's love. Well, actually it is in the four. I just thought of that. So let's look at the four and I'll come back to that. Number one observation is in verse eight. And I didn't read it, but it's in verse 16. Listen carefully. God is love. Now, again, a lot of people draw a blank. Because we think of love in terms of having love versus the revelation of scripture of being love. See, even I, even I fall into the trap of horizontal earthly terminologies of love because somebody will tell me they love me and I just go, I love you more. That's just my flesh and you're not going to outdo me at anything. So they'll say, well, I love you much. And I'll say, I love you more than much. And we'll just go back and forth. I have a friend that texted me just last week and said, I can prove scripturally I love you more than you love me. 
<laughs> Can't wait to see him dance that dance. We think, of ter- we think in terms of having love. We think of, in terms of falling in, a, in it, falling out of it. You know, I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I just don't love you anymore. I, I went to the market, the farmer's market. I was standing over by the debaters and she walked by and I fell out of love with you and I fell in love with her. I even heard a song as a confirmation. Lord have mercy, baby's got her blue jeans on. Do, 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 do. <laughs> let it go, just let it go. We talk about love like it's a virus. You never know when you're gonna get it, you never know how long you'll have it, and you never know when it's gonna leave. (laughs) And so the preacher comes along and says, God loves you. And you draw a blank. Or, yeah, I, I did this, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I mean, we all are on a journey. And this was 40, 38, 40, close to 40 years ago. But I can remember thinking, well, God does love me, but I'm at the end of the gene pool. That he just loves other people more than me. I literally thought people had a corner on God. Certain ministers that I would look up to, meant that, man, God loves them. I tried to go to church as a kid. My family didn't serve God, so I went to a lot of different churches, but I just went every time I could. And I can remember sitting on the front row. I was always on the front row, no offense to anyone at the back or even in the balcony, but (laughs) I had to sit on the front row, not because I was spiritual, I was ADD. I couldn't sit at the back and pay attention, so I had to sit up front. But I'd be sitting up front, I'd be hungry for God, just trying to understand what the preacher's saying. I'm a, t- I'm a teenager, and it was a Pentecostal holiness church, and we had some, anyway, we, we just, we were different. They were different. And every time you got into the Holy Ghost, it just got weird. It was like, you'd just be normal like this. See, I believe the Holy Spirit's all over me right now, but I mean, I'm, in, in my church culture, the Holy Spirit came on you, Woo. It was like a ninja spirit. (laughs) And we had a guest speaker and the Holy Ghost came on the guest speaker. And he said, I see the glory. That's the way they used to talk. I see the glory. Boy, I'm sitting on the front row. I am so excited because I've heard message after message about the glory and all these manifestations of the glory. And back then you used to follow the glory and that's why people change church every month, following the glory. And so then the glory finally showed up. And so he goes, he goes, it's at the back. It's coming in the back. It's, it's coming into the sanctuary. And we were split up into two sides. I was sitting over here. This side was a different side. And he says, and it's hovering over and uh, abiding on this side. My first thought was, wouldn't you know it, God finally showed up at church and he went to that side of the church. I literally had terrible thoughts of God would see you and say, John, you're in my house. What a blessing, Brian, wow, what Randy, it's so good for you to be in my house. He'd see me and go, oh no, you're here again. You're laughing. We've come, I've come a long, long ways, but you've come a little further than you think. I thought God had love. So if you have it, if you have water, you can have a gallon of it, a pint of it, a drop of it, it can be measured. Listen, it can be contained. It can be distributed in different measures. But if you are H2O, you just are. So whatever you are to John, you are to me. 
And I got this revelation out of John 17 when Jesus was praying before he ascended, before he went to the cross and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he was praying for us that we would have unity, that we would be so one, we would be one like the Father and the Son, and that the world would see our love one for another. And listen to this powerful evangelistic tool. They would know God sent Jesus when they see our love for each other. That's yet, I've, I've never heard anybody preach on that yet. That the greatest evangelistic tool we have is to know God's love for us and love each other. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. He goes on to pray and then he says, and that you would reveal to them that you have loved them as you have loved him. I caused a meltdown a few decades ago in a church well, I'm glad these days are behind me. Thank you, Jesus, for the favor I have now. I just can't hardly believe it. I keep pinching myself. Because I literally said in a church setting, God loves you with the same love he has for Jesus. He didn't love Jesus any more than he loves you. And he doesn't love you less than he loves Jesus. And I mean, it caused a meltdown. And I used to think like that. Of course, God loves Jesus. He was perfect. He was holy. Never sinned in word, thought, or deed. Didn't do anything but good. So, of course, God loves Jesus. But <laughs> Ooh, I'm not always good. I don't always have good thoughts. And so I struggled with it years ago. But it, by revelation, I got rooted and grounded. Just think. I had a guy tell me one time, I love this saying. He says, you know. I don't believe a word you just said. But wouldn't it be cool if it was true? He literally didn't believe anything I said, but he said, boy, that would be nice if that was true. I love that about a person. <laughs> Y'all didn't get anything out of that. Maybe you don't believe God loves you right now as much as Jesus with the same exact love. But wouldn't it be cool if it was true? What would happen to your life if you woke up one day and you literally by revelation believed God loves me with the same exact love he has for Jesus. And when those, these people had a cardiac arrest, I was, I'm, I'm more refined now. I used to be a little more, when they confronted me, how could you say that publicly? I just quickly blurted out, if God loved Jesus more than you, why did he give Jesus in a horrific death for you? We don't know how much God loves us, but the Holy Spirit's revealing it, amen. So God doesn't have love for you, God is love for you. And you need to live the rest of your life that whatever he is to Jesus, he is to you in fullness. Number two observation, and this one's powerful too, it's in verse seven, it's in verse seven. Love is of God. Love is of God. Love is not of this world. So anyone in the world talking about love does not know what they're talking about. <laughs> love is not of your flesh. So love is not of you. Love is not of this world, it's not of your flesh, it's not of your carnal, unrenewed mind. Love is of God. So anyone in the world or in the flesh and the works of the flesh that's talking about love, if everybody understood this at a elementary level, no Christian would be deceived when the world starts describing love. When they describe a perversion and call it love, no Christian on the planet should blink knowing that's the spirit of Antichrist. Amen. It's a perverted version of love. It's a false love. It's a demonic replacement, the Antichrist definition of love versus Christ who is love. And yet how many Christians do not recognize and they call love today 
what the world describes as love. The, love to, the world talks about love and you people aren't of love because you're not tolerant. You need to be tolerant. That's the spirit of antichrist and the perversion of long suffering. Love is long suffering, but God's love is not tolerant to immorality and evil and darkness and demonic powers. And yet Christians are deceived and, and we can't figure out why is their faith going shipwrecked? Because they don't know what love is. They don't know love is of God, not of this world, not of our flesh. And that leads, and by the way, <laughs> I raised four kids. I raised two spirit-filled daughters. I can raise the dead. Don't mess with me. <laughs> All four of my kids, like your kids, came to me and said, Dad, how will I know I'm in love? How will I know this person loves me? And you know what the 90% probably more of parents, spirit-filled parents, will look at their children and say, well, well you'll just know. <laughs> and they go, well, how will I know? Oh, well, I mean, you'll, you'll just know. Well, how did you know? Mom was, oh, I just knew. Watch this. Then they show up a month later and they say, Dad, I'm in love. And, 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 and Dad will go, with who? With Susie. Oh, no, you're not. And then you, 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 you confuse them even further. They remind you, you said I would know. Now I'm telling you I know. And now you're telling me I don't know. Are y'all getting this? Yeah. We don't even, the, the onion hadn't been peeled back far enough for us to even understand. 1 Corinthians 13 gives you 16 descriptive character traits of love, which is God. This is what it looks like. It only mentions a couple of times feelings and those are, don't have these negative ones. Like love is slow to anger, et cetera, et cetera. 16 things, boom, 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 boom. And it's like, we don't have the common Bible sense enough to set our kids down and go, okay, here's what it looks like. It doesn't take an account of a wrong done. This girl keeps an account of not every wrong done, but falsely accuses you of wrongs you haven't done, that you'll probably do, but you haven't done yet. That's not love. Okay, I'm, thank God, running out of time. Because can you imagine what a series that would be? Just sitting down and going, okay, let's get our kids ready to not be deceived by this antichrist that calls immorality, unholiness, ungodliness, love, and yet they're rooted in ground. Everybody see, I love you, but many times you send your kids off to these colleges and they haven't been rooted and grounded in love, so they fall off the cliff. But if they were rooted and grounded in God's kind of love, no professor could deceive them, no group could conceive them, no march could conceive, deceive them. People marching, burning stuff down. And Christians don't know that is not God's love. That is not right. Yeah, but. <laughs> okay, thank God I'm on a timeline. Number three. Number three. It's found in verse seven. Let's read it again. Verse seven, because this one's a real revelation for a lot of people. Verse seven, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God, not of the world, of your flesh, of your circumstances. 
Do you know how many people try to interpret God's love based on their circumstances? The Bible doesn't say love is of your circumstances. You'll know God loves you by your circumstances. But how many people interpret God's love based on what's happening all around them? Love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Did everybody see that? Everybody who loves, everybody marching in the streets talking about love, every politician that talks about love, every group that talks about love, God says, to love, you have to be born of God. So anyone not born of God has no clue what love is, much less can define it, much less can hold you accountable or judge you for the lack thereof. You have to be born of God. Everyone that God said this, I didn't say this, so stick with me. God said, everybody who loves is born of God and knows God. There's the revelation by the Holy Spirit. Now watch this, this is good. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. Holy Ghost talking to anybody? Okay, for the younger people, Holy Spirit. Those of us that are older, it's the Holy Ghost, bless God. Is the Holy Ghost talking to anybody? All right, two things have to happen for you to love. You gotta be born of God and you gotta what? Know God, you have to have a revelation of God. If you do not love, John said, you don't know God. He didn't say you weren't born of God. He said you don't know God. This is why, I hate to keep talking about the three, third great awakening but I believe I've seen the spearhead of this, of grace and truth being the spearhead. And in the great awakening that has begun, we're going to see a shakening in the church and we're going to finally see people going from being a convert to a disciple. Our churches are full of converts with a handful of disciples. And this answers the question, why are so many Christians unloving? Why are so many churches that I've gone into? I bear witness these people are born again, but they do not know God. The only way you can love with God's kind of love is to be born of God and know God. And many of us here, many that are watching, that are part of our partners and outreaches, you've got to go from a convert to a disciple. This argument that I've had to face my whole life with carnal Christians and leaders and immature leadership is well, what matters is getting them born again. And if we got to pick, we're going to pick born again. Well. Who said we have to pick? And who said, I don't see the importance of getting everybody born again. But we can get everybody in this country born again and we're gonna go down the tubes. Because they won't know how to vote. They won't know how to discern. They won't know good from evil. They won't know how to judge righteously. They won't know how to love each other. It really is. Somebody pat me on the back. I can't reach back there. Uh, it's like, I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I know I'm not the only one that wants to be all God's called me to be. Now, I know I've got, a, I've got an edge now on most people and I'm trying to process it. I know I died. I've told you about that. And I know I met Jesus and it does something to you. Something like that does something to you. My passion isn't any, well, it might be a little great. I don't know how to explain that. I don't understand how you can get born again and stuck. 
I don't understand how you can go to church and fight and fuss all the time or just quit. That doesn't come, I can't, I can't process that because I've been called, dear ones, you've been called to walk in great faith in these last days and we have to understand the ecosystem of faith and how love, faith works by love. You see God's love for you. You get rooted and grounded in God's love for you. You can believe for great things. We can be a health refuge as a community. We can be a place of safety for people when things really start falling apart. Hallelujah. I'm gonna say it one more time. Love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. So wake up, train your kids. When people not born of God talk about love, it's foolishness. Don't even waver or listen. Amen or oh me. Because love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God. And he that doesn't love knoweth not God. Aren't you glad? Aren't you? Let's, let, let's take a breath here. I need a breath. Whew. Thank you, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for not saying this. Love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. And he that doesn't love knoweth not God and ain't born of God. <laughs> Oh, y'all aren't getting the humor in this. I mean, I would have panicked years ago because I knew I was born of God. I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I did not love in that situation. I didn't even know how to love in that situation. But the Holy Spirit didn't say, well, you must not be saved. No, the Holy Spirit says, let me show you God. (laughs) Let me show you God. Let me reveal God. Let me peel your onion, dude. (laughs) And you start crying. Anybody peeled an onion? No. You start bawling like the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, that's so beautiful. Oh, God, I can't take it anymore. The onion of love, when it's peeled, will just rock you in your innermost being. All right, the last one. Number four. Number four observation, love is revealed in the cross. Verse nine, I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna read it again, but I know God's love for me, not by my emotions. Listen, love is not of my emotions. Love is of God. Will it affect my emotions in times? Yes. But your emotions are fickle. Have you figured it out yet? You can't trust them. Even good ones. Much less bad ones. Love is of God. Not of my emotions. Not of this world. Not of my flesh. Not of me, independent of God. And how does the Holy Spirit peel the onion? How does he reveal God's love? Every time we talk about things connected to the cross, I may do a series here soon, if the Lord would would allow, on the preaching of the cross. How that it's the power of God to those who believe. Foolishness to the world, but it's the power of God to those of us. Which, and you know, I, I, I go through evolutions of thinking just like you do. And you read that. And, and if you don't wait and let the Holy Spirit kind of help you out, you know, the, how is preaching a piece of wood powerful? The cross. It's like that doesn't make sense. But how many of you know everything Jesus did for you on that cross When we talk about it, that's the power of God saving you. 
When we talk about forgiveness and what it really means, that's God's love. When we talk about grace, that's God's love. When we talk about mercy, that's God's love. And so anything connected to the most powerful event in human history and in the cosmos, the cross, we're talking about God's love. And man, the Holy Spirit show it to you how forgiven you are. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. And on and on I could go, and, and that would be a great series, trying to take this one environment of love connected to faith right now, but what about on its own? There's some deep stuff to God's love for you. There's some wide stuff to God's love for you. There's some super high stuff. I think the universe is still expanding and it's been expanding since God slung it into existence with his word. And part of the expansion of that universe for eternity will testify of how high, broad, wide, and deep God's love for you is. That it's like the universe. It can't be contained. It can only be experienced. It can't be manipulated can only be experienced and enjoyed. Did anybody get anything today? Yeah. Hallelujah.